Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. My name is Leah Pappas and I'm presenting today with my colleagues from the Hawu community, Naomi thomas Murray and Leonardo Lede Lai. We will be presenting on gesture in video language documentation. Now throughout the presentation, um, we will first introduce you to the Hawu language. Um, then we will discuss gesture, why it's important, give some examples. And finally, we'll close with some suggestions for taking gesture into consideration while doing language documentation work. So right now we're in the midst of a Hawu documentation project. And with this project, it's a multimodal documentation project, meaning that we're focusing on making sure we collect both gesture and language. Um, and we're collecting a plethora of different kinds of um, different kinds of texts, largely dependent on what the speakers are interested in talking about. Um, but so far we've collected a lot of narratives, folk stories, and cultural information. Most of our speakers are older speakers, but we do have some younger speakers. And because of COVID, everything is currently remote right now. So I'm here in the United States and Naomi and Leo are in Indonesia collecting the data and processing it and doing a lot of the work there. And then we collaborate online. So before we jump into gesture, Naomi is going to give you some information on the Hawu language and um, some cultural information. Lihau or Sabu language is one of the regional languages in NTT, which is used by the Sabu people as colloquial language. Furthermore, Sabu people also use Indonesian in their daily communication. Lihau or Sabu language always used in weddings, funerals, and other traditional rituals. Lihau has five dialects, namely Mehara, Liai, Seba, Sabu Timur, and Raijua. The Sabu people have many cultures, and one of them is the culture of kissing nose. This culture is always carried out by the Sabu people who are in Sabu and outside the Sabu island. Sabu people uh, kiss the nose when they meet in a special event. This kissing is a sign of the brotherhood, peace, and affection. Okay, now that you're somewhat familiar with Hawu, I want to transition it into gesture and talking about why this is an important thing that we should document. Um, so we're coming from the perspective that gesture is a critical part of communication. Gesture researchers view an utterance to include two elements, the verbal stream, which is the information that's contributed by the voice, and the gestural stream, the information contributed by the body. And these two elements are produced at the same time in a maximally communicative utterance. We also often think of gesture as a universal language because what do we do when we don't have language to communicate? We use gesture, but it also can be somewhat disingenuous in that, lang in that how we gesture, when we gesture, why, how much, et cetera, is not necessarily universal. Um, it can vary by language, by region, by culture, even by person. So it's an important thing to document as we search to understand the, the diversity of human communication. Now, unfortunately, just like language, most of the most gesture studies have focused on widely spoken European languages, um, but gesture researchers are in the process of diversifying the documentation just as linguists are. As someone who's interested in language, gesture can be a very useful tool for many different things. For instance, gesture can give pragmatic and interactional information. So gesture can let someone know when it's their turn to speak, when someone is done speaking, whether they understand, whether they agree. You know, all of this can be communicated via body language. For phonologists, gesture can be interesting in the context of stress. Gestures often occur on stressed syllables and so can give information as to how words are stressed in a stress study. Gesture can also give um, specialized cultural, contextual information, which we'll give you an example of in a moment. It can also reveal cognitive processes that are not available in language. So these are left out of language, but shown through gesture. It can reveal the setting of the speech event. Um, every speech event is rooted in the environment in which it's spoken, and gesture can be one way in which the speakers refer to the environment as they speak. And there are many, many more ways that gesture can inform research. Um, but we should also remember that as language documenters, our goals are to be maximally informative, right? Make 
make um, videos that are maximally useful to a broad range of people. Um, and they should aim to be objective. And so we should be aware of the fact that gesture could be something that researchers are interested in and that these could that our documentation could be very useful for gesture researchers. So we're going to provide you with some examples of areas where gesture is really important to fully understanding what the speaker is saying. Um, in this first example, this man is telling a story of his life. He's talking about his very first home that he built for his family. Um, and I will let him do the talking. <laughs> Okay, so the man is saying, um, it's like this house, the house over there. Um, and as he's speaking, he's pointing to a house that is not, he can't actually see because he's inside of a home, but he's pointing in the general direction of the house. Um, and in this instance, the language isn't giving us any information about what the house looks like, but the gesture is is orienting our, our attention towards that house. Um, another example is, this is, this is a, an example where gesture is giving cultural information. And so Naomi is going to introduce um, Mira or palm juice and how important it is to the Hawa people. Mira or palm juice is one of the necessity of, the, of life for the Sabu people. The palm juice or Nira is processed into red sugar and we call it gula chair and gula lempeng. Besides being consumed as stable food, sugar is also sold to help the economy needs of the Sabu people. Now the nira or palm juice has also been processed into powder sugar and we call it gula samut and soapy or alcohol. So the palm juice of Sabu community is greatly help the economy of Sabu people. Because of how important the collection of palm juice is, we've actually had a lot of people interested in talking about the process of collecting and processing the palm juice. Um, and in these, in these examples, we've actually found some recurring gestures that um, seem to be very cultural specific. So um, this man is describing collecting palm juice and watch his gesture as he talks about a tool called the ngapi. <laughs> Okay, so you can see that his gesture, he's lifting his arm up to his shoulder. He's opening and closing his arm while having his other arm inside like this. Okay, a very specific gesture. And now in our translation, we use the word clamp. As someone who's not from Hawu, you hear the word clamp and you could think of a bunch of different ways that something could be clamped. Um, and in this instance, he's saying clamp the ngapi like this, like that. It's like, okay, well, like what? You can only get that information if you're looking at the gesture. Um, now let's take a look at this man who has is talking about the same thing, but he has access to the tool and watch what he does with the tool. This is the ngapi. Okay, so you can see that the ngapi is actually two sticks that are clamped together at the end it, to make a joint. And to use it, you put it over your shoulder and you open and close it, okay? And the fruit goes in between the two sticks. So now that you see the tool, if we return to this man's gesture. All of a sudden you can see how his gesture relates to the, 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 the tool, the ngapi, okay? His, arm is acting as the tool, his elbow is the joint where the two sticks are together, and he's opening and closing it like you would with the actual tool. Now his other hand is going in the middle, acting as the fruit that's being clamped between the two between the two sticks. Okay, so this is a very specific gesture. You have to have knowledge of the tool to understand what the gesture is doing. And we found that it's very common. Here's another man who's talking about um, collecting palm juice, and you can see he does the same thing. Okay, so you can see again and again, he's doing this gesture, this gesture, where he's taking the fruit, putting it in the ngapi, and using his arm as the tool. Okay, so those are just two examples. Honestly, there could be a ton, but those are two examples of places where 
the gestures in the recordings are so important to understanding the actual content of the utterance, okay? Um, so now that we hopefully have an idea of how important gesture is, let's turn to how we should account for it, how we should document gesture. Gesture as a visual medium, the most basic way to account for it is to use video in our documentation projects, quite simply. Um, and luckily, video has become such an integral feature of documentation projects that that's quite simple to do at this point. Um, but just using video is not necessarily enough, depending on the situation. It's important to be informed as to how gestures might manifest within the speech event and how to account for them. Um, so if we look at this diagram on the right hand side of the screen, you can see that there's a center area and then an extreme periphery. And most gestures occur in the center area. Now, occasionally they will extend into the periphery. And this is generally how gestures are treated. And often if you simply go by this, you'll get a fair amount of gestures. But where people gesture, how they gesture, how much, how big can vary based on the sitting position whether they're sitting or standing, um, and also the topic that they're talking about might cause them to orient their gestures in a certain way, make them larger or smaller. Um, and so it's important to be informed about these topics before recording so that we can set up the, the recording appropriately. Um, let's take a look at this video here. Now, as I said, according to this diagram, most gestures occur within the center, um, but this is a man who is describing the layout of a traditional hagu home and he's using very large gestures. Kita kata arela ne e demin he era. Kita pela de parra he dou ru uru kani de kani no ne. Okay, so this video is pulled very far back. You get a lot of space around the speakers. But because of how he's gesturing, this is really important. Sometimes his his hands reach the top of the screen. And so he's really using the space widely and now if we also look. Kita kata arela ne e demin he era. Lying on the ground um, in front of him. And this we found to be common among people who are sitting on the ground as they're speaking. Um, for the purposes of this presentation, we're calling this floor drawing, um, where as the speaker is talking, he's kind of using the floor as a tableau to orient his gestures on. Um, so here's another example. This man is describing the different shapes of graves of Hawu people depending on their religion. Ro ada jengiti wah di dalam kawore. Ro ada rani adi demi dera demi balad pih. So we have these gestures that are oriented towards the floor, as if he's looking down on on these graves and tracing them and pointing to them. Um, but they're not captured in the video, right? Um, and so this is the moment where where we realized, oh, this is a common gesture that we're seeing occur in our videos. We need to make sure that we're orienting. The camera so that we're capturing those. Okay, another example is how the topic might change what kinds of gestures are being um, used and where they're being used. Um, so in this video, um, Naomi and Leo are giving directions and um, we set up the recording so that it was able to get all three of us talking. So you can't ideally see Leo and I, but you can see enough of us that we can also also see each other as we're having the conversation. Um, we didn't take into account the fact that because we're collecting directions, um, the gestures might not be oriented towards the camera. In fact, most places that we were, most places that they were talking about were actually behind them. And so I'll let you watch Leo give directions to a location. Um, so he's giving directions to something that's actually away from the camera. And in Hawu, sometimes people point in the direction of the thing that they're locating rather than keeping the directions in front of them. And this was something that was not taken into account when we first made the video. Um, and so you can see when he's gesturing, actually most of his gestures are concealed by his body and his body has kind of shifted away because most of the places we're talking about are actually located um, away from the camera. Our final example is listener interaction. As language documenters, we are often thinking of the language that's really important because we're interested in language, but the listeners can give just as much information about the speech event 
um, without using language. And so this is given by body language or gestures. So here's an example where a woman is, she's a weaver and she's describing the different parts of the weaving. They all have different names, the different designs, and she's pointing them out on a weaving. Um, she's on the left talking and Leo is on the right listening. And you can watch his gestures as she speaks. <laughs> Okay, so you can see that um, as she's pointing, his hands are somewhat following her, right? Um, as a way almost to say like, hey, I'm listening. Hey, I'm understanding. Yeah, I did see that, etc. cetera. Um, so even though he's not speaking until the very end of the video, his gestures are indicating engagement. Okay, and so it's also important to consider that maybe we need to get the listener. Okay, so those are some examples, um, largely where, as we were doing the documentation process, we realized, oh, this is an important thing to document. So coming away, stepping back from what we just talked about, um, we want to offer some suggestions for documenting gesture. So first and foremost, most importantly, always use video, at least you're getting some gesture. Um, when setting up the video, it's important to get the full range of motion. Um, and the best way to do that is to set the camera farther back. You may not be getting minimal details, but you're getting the environment. You're being more objective by just collecting the speech event as it's happening. Um, also, when possible, make sure you're getting both the speaker and the listener. You never know when the listener will talk, but the listener is also contributing to the speech event, even when they're not talking. They're doing so via gesture often. Now, with that in mind, we want to make sure that we're adjusting the video camera or the speaker based on the topic that they're talking about, um, their sitting position, their standing position, et cetera. And so as we're documenting, we should consider all of those things to maximize the amount of gesture that we're able to document. Now, some possible techniques that we're suggesting here um, include, if possible, use two video cameras. In that way, you can get one in front of the body and you can get one in the direction that gestures are happening. Maybe one in front and one behind or one on front and one to the side. Um, it's also possible that you could get one, you could have one video camera focused on the speaker while the other is angled downwards collecting floor drawings or whatever is whatever kinds of gestures might be oriented towards the ground. Um, also possible to get have one camera on the speaker, one on the environment, etc. Um, now, obviously, in all of our examples, we only have one video camera, simply because we only had one video camera to use. And in those instances, you can be informed on how you set up the documentation event. So it might, it might make sense to choose an angle that will maximize the amount of information possible. So if, you're, if you realize that the speaker is sitting cross-legged on the floor, angle the video camera downward more because they're likely to use the floor, at least in our case in Hagu. That's what we would do. Um, or alternatively, it might be important to make sure you're orienting the recording session so that the speakers are going to be gesturing towards the camera and not away from the camera. So in that example where we showed you where we were collecting um, directions, it would have actually made more sense if the video camera had been on the other side because that was the way that the speakers were gesturing the most. Um, we also suggest that it might be useful to record the environment before or after the conversation. If someone references a house, like in the example, um, like in the example earlier in the presentation, we have reference to that house. Okay, so these are just some suggestions. Um, if you've, if you have any others that you've thought about um, as you've done your own documentation or listened to this presentation, um, we'll be very excited to talk about them in the Q and A session. So until then, thank you very much. Thanks for listening. And we look forward to talking with all of you soon. Um, finally, here are some resources uh, on gesture if you're interested in learning more. Um, for language documentation purposes, I particularly recommend um, Mandana Seyfedinipur's Reasons for Documenting Gestures and Suggestions for How to Go About It. She gives a lot of detailed information. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you for listening. And we look forward to talking to you all soon.